Welcome back to The Dad Chronicle. I'm your host, Alex Albisu. This is episode 74. Now, before we get started, I want to remind you that you can visit thedadchronicle.com to subscribe for free. Make sure that you're not missing out on a single episode. All the links to your favorite podcatchers are there, and you can listen to the episodes directly from the website as well. Now, on today's episode, I speak to Dr. Michael Rucker. Now, Michael is writing a book on the topic of fun, and he brings a lot of wisdom to the conversation around how you can best connect with your child. And also, this whole idea about bringing fun and joy into your life is tremendously important, um, especially with how stressful parenting can be. We talk about how Michael brought joy into the very mundane or stressful routines that he and his family experienced day in and day out. And we would both react to it um, in a very negative way, you know, um, which would create the sort of environment of negative affect for all four of us because none of it um, really contributed to joy, right, quote unquote. We talk about the importance of reconnecting with your inner child. You know, your kid is still a child and you have that opportunity to engage in fun and play with them. Um, and reconnect with that inner child yourself, you know, is an additive benefit, in my opinion. And Michael also shares how he and his wife made pretty drastic changes in their life, all to benefit their marriage, their family, and their mental well-being. So we did something drastic, which, you know, I don't know that I would recommend it to everyone. And it certainly um, is a little bit specific to us. Um, but we just blew everything up. Here's my conversation with fun enthusiast, author, and dad, Michael Rucker. Hello, Mike Rucker. Thank you for being on The Dad Chronicle. How are you? I am good. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I guess both you and I here on the East Coast are dealing with a bit of rain. Oh, man. We were actually scared. For the folks at home, we were a little scared we weren't, we weren't going to be able to do this recording because, you know, good old, like, swampy uh, summer sort of weather here on our end of the, uh, of the – we were dealing with crazy storms, man. It was a little bit insane. It, we, we're, we've yeah. been dealing with bad, bad flooding here in the D.C. area. So oh, I don't know about you guys down that. there. No, not too bad here in North Carolina yet. But, um, you know, uh, prayers to uh, those folks in Louisiana. I think they're about to get walloped. Yeah. So. Ugh. Well, um, you know, Mike brings a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom around this topic of fun, which we're, we're going to dive into. And it's a really fascinating topic. Uh, Mike reached out to me, and he's in the midst of writing a book. We're going to talk a bit about that. Um, and But also, Mike's a dad. And we're going to learn a little bit about his family life right now, a little bit about him. So, Mike, do you mind introducing yourself to the folks at home? Uh, sure. My name's uh, Mike Rucker. As you mentioned, um, uh, currently a uh, working on a book about fun. I've been blogging about it here now for too many years to count. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, enjoy being a dad. I have a daughter who's seven and a tenacious four-year-old son. Um, and we're having a lot of fun. You know, summer is a great time. I talk a lot in my writing about mindset. And I think, you know, the nice thing about summer is it's a mental frame that anyone can kind of grab onto, you know, to uh, easily slip into that vacation mindset. And we're certainly making the best of it. We just got back. Um, from Wilmington, so enjoyed some beach time before the weather did, you know, come in and um, make it a little bit more hot and humid. Uh, where inside is a little bit more desirable right now, but oh, yeah. yeah, I've been making the best of it. Um, yeah, well, like what what type of uh, fun stuff do you do with the family? Uh, you know, the the guy who's known for for studying fun, like what's fun for the Rucker family? Uh, so I, it kind of runs the gambit, right? Like um, I travel quite a bit, so I try um, to fit fun into the nightly routine while I'm here. Um, one of the things that I like to do, which is really awesome, I think it's not something that's as common as it should be, but, uh, you know, I really like to rough house. I think that's sort of one of dad's roles, right? And um, my wife likes a little bit more structure, uh, but we have, you know, uh, we've developed a really good relationship to give each other the boundaries where we can sort of play the part that we want to play. And so uh, every night or almost every night, um, the kids and I do something called Tickle Monster. One of the benefits of moving here to the South versus where we used to be in the Bay Area is we have uh, a lot of room to roam with inside our home. And so um, I turn on uh, some punk rock or some heavy metal. And for uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I just chase them all around. You know, we kind of 
play different versions of hide and seek. And uh, the one they love the most is Tickle Monster, where they try and avoid me. And if I catch them, I get to tickle them to death. So, oh, I love it. Um, my wife, yeah, my, uh, my daughter and I did okay. a little bit of that earlier. It was it's so funny because, you know, she's two and, and she runs up. She's like, monster, monster. And I'm like, nice. oh, OK, you know, we jump right into it. Yeah, you're right, though. That's like the role of the dad. I think that's a that's a cool thing that you're doing. Yeah, I, I meant. Uh, well, thank you for that. I mean, it's interesting, right? Because, you know, roles, you know, and the masks that we wear and all that gets so much attention nowadays. But, um, you know, I think we, for us, you know, we're a little bit nuclear um, in that sense. And so it suits us. And um, and then I also like that we put pause on sort of judgment. So there are times where, um, you know, Anna, kind of, Anna my wife, um, you know, wants it her way. And I certainly abide there because she does, you know, put her, um, you know, things that might rub her the wrong way. We both sort of develop this skill where, um, we can give each other space. Um, you know, whether that just means walking away so that if it is an antagonist, you know, it's not in our face. Um, but I think once you give your partner that type of freedom instead of trying to change the situation, but instead, you know, um, just give it the space to breathe. And if it's not for you, you know, walk away from it. Um, like for her, she really likes a rigorous morning routine um, because, you know, she does like a lot more sort of structure and control in, in a good way. I mean, those are very objective statements, um, you know, and um, so I try to abide uh, where, you know, maybe I would like the kids to have a little bit more autonomy um, in what they do. Um, you know, having that routine really suits us. And even if it's not the way I would do it, I've uh, learned to, um, you know, have less of an opinion because it's my opinion doesn't really contribute to, a, you know, to making anything better. Right. It's really either just going to irritate me or um, and I think, you know, one of the things there was before when I didn't take that approach um, it certainly did contribute to a more not fun environment. And mm. so um, that one's an interesting anecdote where our morning routines were actually pretty awful, especially, you know, some of it uh, we've evolved out of it as our son has gotten older. Um, but when he was, you know, two, he really, you know, the quintessential sort of terrible twos where, you know, he'd be eating a cereal and then for no reason just throw it on the ground, right? Ugh. Um, yeah. and we would both react to it, um, in a very negative way, you know, um, which would create the sort of environment of negative affect for all four of us, because none of it, um, really contributed to joy, right. Quote unquote. And, um, so I think there's been some serendipity where we have all sort of met in the middle and we've, uh, one of the things that I sort of, you know, preach about in my writing is this idea that you, one of our best mechanisms for creating um, the environment that we want, whether that's fun or whether it's, you know, being healthy or, or whatever, you know, your particular interest is, if you set your environment up to have a bias towards that affinity, um, then you just, you know, sort of manifest a lot more of that in your life. And so since fun is, you know, a guiding principle for me, we really tried to make our morning routine more fun. Um, and part of that, you know, to circle back on, on that initial thought is me getting out of the way, you yeah. know, and not, you know, sort of having an opinion. And about was, it. Yeah. Well, and that's really hard. I, I think that that's really hard for a lot of people to accept and to do in relationships. I think in, in some cases, parents will have, you know, in a perfect world, you have parents that really um, align and understand the perfect way to raise their kids and they are on the same path 100% of the time. We all know that that's not the same for, for that's not the same for a majority of people out there. I would say 99% of the people out there. I know that Deanne and I encounter these situations because parenting is a brand new thing for us as it is for a lot, you know, pretty much everybody going into this thing. What was the, the catalyst for you kind of realizing that you needed to stay out of the way and, and how did you really coach yourself and, and find that acceptance to stay out of the way? I think for us, it happened luck. Like I'd love to give you some profound piece of advice. And I think like many parents, we just stumbled upon it. Um, you know, a bit of it was survival. Um, but I think some was mutual respect, right? There was a light bulb that went on for both of us at some point. And I think it, you know, 
um, a lot of people like these sort of discrete life events. I, I, my life tends to be a little bit more blurry and gray than, you know, and, uh, uh, but so to answer your question, um, I think we've grown to realize that instead of trying to change one, one another, or, you know, convince one or another that, um, their way, you know, our way or the highway, um, we've learned to sort of, instead of meet in the middle, allow each other to have influence of a particular situation. Um, and so, you know, 80% of the time that's going to work, right? I don't, um, in, in the morning, she has a more defined um, set point when she has to be at work. So it's understandable why she wants more control over that particular situation, because at the end of the day, she needs to get to work at a certain time. Where since, you know, right now for the last couple of years, uh, me being on the East Coast working for a California company, um, you know, I can, if I get on at 8.30 Eastern time, you know, that's 5.30 in California, no, no one's checking their email, right? So I have a lot more latitude. And therefore, why do I need to influence that particular hour in our day when it means more to her? Right. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, it sounds like you're really, I think, I think the, the mindfulness, the awareness of, of your partners, I, I think that, so, you know, if you think a lot about how you s take a step out of your own shoes to live the life of somebody else's and, you know, taking that moment to really get out of your own head and think about what your partner is going through in that case and being um, considerate and compassionate and empathetic towards that. I think that that's a, a big part of it, certainly. Um, and, you know, you and I had a conversation about, uh, you know, some of the ways that, you know, you, you, when you're when you're getting in kind of that rut and you're kind of talking about this, right? Like you you identify that there are issues in your uh, in your situation at home, whether that be, you know, a, a, a conflict with your spouse, uh, a an issue with whatever your your kids are doing. You know, we talked about this idea of mindfulness and kind of being present in the situation. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you do that and maybe some of the uh, the philosophy behind some of that? Yeah, so uh, that's a good point. Um, and it's something that we've certainly both, you know, worked on. Um, I think it's a skill that you develop. Um, and the thing about that is, you know, if you're in it, then there's stressors that are going to sort of go away, right? If we're not in the present, then we're indexing either things in the past or we're sort of creating what possibly could happen in the future. Um, and so if you're in the moment with whatever that particular situation is, you can handle things as they come up. Um, but another thing that's really important there is I think kids respond to that sort of energy that you give them when you are there. Um, you know, the classic uh, sort of um, example right now is the fact that uh, parents are always on their phones, right? And so um, I think it would be easy to stick with that, but it's a lot more than that. I mean, if you, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about transitional, not, or excuse me, transactional analysis, where a lot of adults, you know, are always in the parent-like or adult-like state, um, and don't reconnect to sort of uh, the childlike state that's inherent in all of us, because we all know how to be a child. Yet, for whatever reason, we don't act like that with our kids. And therefore, we don't create any sort of bond because they're always looking at us, you know, as this giant that's giving them rules. And so being mindful of the fact that, you know, your kid is still a child and you have that opportunity to engage in fun and play with them. Um, and reconnect with that inner child yourself, you know, is an additive benefit, in my opinion. You know, it, it's a one plus one equals three proposition rather than looking at, um, you know, if you're not mindful and you're like, oh, it's my night to have the kids, you know, let's go get Netflix so that I can answer those last 10 emails while they watch Frozen for the 50th time. <laughs> like, it's just a waste of everyone's time, yeah. you know? Um, and Nine times out of 10, when you have people look back whether or not those emails were important, they never were, um, you know, and it speaks to sort of this hustle porn slash burnout situation that we currently find ourselves in um, because we are always on now, right? Like if you don't 
if you feel like that thing is hanging over your head, then you've never really disconnected from work and you're never really being, um, you know, a true parent to your kids or a spouse to your partner. Um, and it's a shame. And I think that's, you know, some people like myself are lucky to just stumble upon that. And then some people, you know, for whatever reason, because something terrible has happened or, you know, they feel that disconnection and they want to do better, you know, seek out sources to, to mitigate that. But, um, you know, it's just sort of happened to us. It's evolved over time, right. That we have so many things, you know, we live in a world of distraction and we also, um, you know, because it's an always on culture have lost the fact that there are three modes to our ego. Once we get, you know, once we do become parents. Um, but that third one, you know, reverting back to childlike, um, is important. It feeds our soul. And so many people just lose that aspect, you know, think that, you know, especially after second or third child, um, that fun is a luxury or they feel guilty about it. Um, and it's a shame. That's so, it's so true because I think so. and, and, And I fall in this trap too. And I'm sure everybody listening to this show feels this, right? Like I I've got, work. I got my day job. And then I got all these projects that I also do with like the dad chronicle with joystick and mouse. Um, I'm doing a bunch of other kind of freelance work with, uh, you know, America's X top podcaster and a bunch of other things. I'm constantly busy. And then I'm also a dad. And I talked about this in the dad chronicle community, um, too. And a bunch of people chimed in too. It's like, how do you stay, you know, present? I, I feel I, I was, and I told, I talked to, uh, my wife about this. I said, I feel guilty sometimes if I'm not doing something that can really help uh, progress the Dad Chronicle, or to um, you know, if I'm not looking up news articles for Joystick and Mouse to talk about video game stuff and news, and you know, for for me, I think it comes down to it's a just being aware and in the moment. Do do you have? any thoughts on how people, and I'm going to ask you like selfishly for me, like what can I do to, to kind of be a little bit more aware and mindful in the moment? It really is a mindset, right? So there's like very clinical things I could teach you. Like if you feel, um, you know, that you need sort of a prompt, um, you know, one of the most common things. And once I tell you this, you're going to probably see like one out of 20 people actually have this and go, Oh, but you know, it's just to have a rubber band around your wrist. So if you find that you're always distracted, you know, especially if it's like an hour of play with your child and you're like, wow, you know, I've spent this whole hour and I really only remember two or three minutes of it. And I wasn't engaged. You can snap the rubber band on your wrist. Like every time you sort of have that, you know, uh, negative intention to disengage from being present. Um, and so that would work with, you know, child or, or whatever it is that you're kind of distracted from. So that's a very tactical that's a, strategy. Yeah, that's a good, and I, and you know, you're, you're talking about that and, and I remember people talking about that. So like, yeah, that, that's actually a very easy thing to do. No, but, but, but please well, continue. And sometimes it's the simplest things, right? Like I've learned to when I'm de- so this is an important concept. I'm, it's going to be a little bit existential, but, and then I'll get back to the simple, right? Because that's, what's going to be the point of this, uh, of this short narrative, um, is that we do tend to build these complex systems, right? What you just shared with me, like I'm imagining your life and we've only known, you know, we've gotten to get to know each other now a few hours. Um, but like the immense amount of complexity to the systems that you must have to organize your life as a parent and a spouse and a podcaster and, you know, an important part of your company with regards to the technology that probably runs its backbone. I can only imagine that complexity, right? And where I've found, um, especially if I'm trying to get back to basics, is how can I de- Um, construct my current system and get back to the most simple if something isn't working. Um, And so that's why I think like as silly as that rubber band thing sounds, it's probably the most effective for 90% of the people that are, you know, need that kind of advice, right? Rather than like going on and saying, no, why don't you go buy a muse and, you know, practice meditation for, you know, the 30 minutes a day that you don't have, you know, where it's probably better that you get sleep. So you're just a normal person around your family. Um, (laughs) But 
So another simple tactic is just that mindset, right? I think, um, you know, the last time we chatted, I, we're, I'm seeing more and more studies where just having, just being intentional about how you approach um, a certain finite amount of time has so much impact, even though it sounds silly, right? Like, so a really neat study that just came out of UCLA by a researcher named Cassie Holmes was she had people just sort of have the intention of going into a weekend and treating it like a vacation. No other instruction, just literally, you know, um, that suggestion, um, you know, that reframe that, okay, it's not a weekend. Um, it's actually a mini vacation yeah. and they could do whatever they wanted to with that piece of information. Um, and it just had a host of benefits rather than, you know, kind of sequentially bolting them out. I would just suggest anyone that's interested to Google that research, but you can do that strategy with anything, right? So, um, let's say it's an hour of play with your child. Mm -hmm. Um, for this hour, I'm going to be the tickle monster, right? And then you just set that intention and that's what you are. And you're mindful of the fact that your role in that hour with your child is being the tickle monster, right? And what it, there's just a, a magic quality to that, that, um, you know, where that's half the battle. Um, because if you don't set that intention, right, then everything else seeps in. Like, uh, you know, I really hope we end right at 8.01 because I need 50 minutes to, you know, answer these five emails and edit that podcast. Because if not, then I'm only going to five hours of sleep and the next day is going to suck. You know, it's like, <laughs> you're, um, you're narrating my life. <laughs> I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. No, cause it's awareness. And, and actually what, what you're really bringing up is, is profound. It's making me actually take a moment to reflect and, and remember some of the, the books that I've read. And there's a great book by Dr. Wayne Dyer called the power of intention. Have you read that? I'm familiar. I've read a lot of Dwyer's, uh, sorry, Wayne stuff, but um, I'm yeah. not intimately familiar with that title. Well, this is a great book. It's kind of a dry read, um, and, but I, I, you know, I, I, I enjoy reading stuff every once in a while when I need that sort of pick me up. And and this was one of those perfect in my in that moment I needed this to be you know, told to me, and you're actually really regurgitating a bit of what he, of what he shared in that book or, or the principles around it. And one of those things that he talks about is just simply stating, I intend to X, Y, Z. And when you're saying that you're really tapping into this spirit of intention as he kind of talks about it. And, um, he almost talks about it in like sort of a godlike state where, where you're, you're really, um, embracing and, and by just stating that you you intend to do something that it will come into fruition and that you need to constantly reiterate that to yourself. And that really helps to promote that intentionalness. Is that the word intentionalness? Let's say, let's no, say it's but I word. like it, you know, it's, it's fine. <laughs> um, well, and it could be, it is now, right? I think, you know, all, all words are what we make of them. I, uh, I won't get off on the tangent, but one of my, a book that just opened my eyes to everything with Sapiens. Have you read that one yet? No, no, I haven't. Um, it's amazing. Once you read it, you realize that everything is made up. It's just, it's <laughs> Isn't it? the you idea know? that social constructs, you know, are the fabric that basically everything is fake, right? Like, um, anyways, I digress because we could really go <laughs> down a deep rabbit hole. Um, but, uh, I'm for, if it is a word, great. If it's not, forgive yourself because all words are made up. That's so, right. I, I like that. Um, that's great. <laughs> no, but I think that's right. You know, I, so just to be authentic, I tend, and that's why I'm sure that I sort of avoided that book because I did, um, when I was first attracted to Wayne's stuff, it was, he was one of the first guys um, that had some interesting ideas on meditation. And um, this, so, uh, but, my confession is that I, the metaphysical, especially, you know, people that believe in the law of attraction, um, that's not sort of part of my ethos. I tend to be more empirically founded, but the idea of intention is so grounded in science as well, that that's great, right? It can coexist in both realms. Um, you right. know, people that believe that they can manifest stuff and science also backs it up, right? It goes back to those ideas that if you are intentional, you start to develop patterns, heuristics, your own environment that support, um, you know, what you're intentional about. And 
uh, mindfulness kind of does that in the moment, which is what's great, right? And so, again, it's such an easy tactic. And why I like the vacation study is because how simple is that, right? Um, you know, okay, my weekend's a vacation. You're not doing anything else, and yet all of these, you know, uh, uh, benefits come up from it. And you can do the same thing as saying, I'm going to be a dad for this hour. Um, and if you don't do it, there's cognitive dissonance that sort of aligns you back to that goalpost. And like, wait, no, I said, you, you know, you start to like, I mean, how asinine is it if you can't be a dad for an hour, right? So it's also <laughs> like this micro goal too, because yeah. if you can't do it, you know, there might be something clinical where, you know, our dialogue isn't, you, you need to transcend the the value of the dialogue you and I are having and right. maybe get, you know, deeper help. But um, so that's another neat thing about being mindful in the moment is that you can really set yourself up for, um, you know, what's commonly free, referred to as easy wins that, you know, create the snowball. Um, and again, you know, back to being a little bit vulnerable, I think that's, you know, what happened with my wife and I, because certainly I don't, um, you know, I begin, I've begun to paint this picture that everything is rosy. And certainly, um, you know, the first couple of years um, of my son's existence, we were overwhelmed. Um, you know, our daughter, well, both kids are amazing. You know, I, I, again, being intentional, um, I do think we set the stage for, you know, if we start defining our children, um, somehow they pick up on it. So uh, we have great kids. I just, my son was quite a different challenge um, than my daughter. Um, and so we weren't, you know, set up for it. Um, you know, we thought that, uh, you know, the work would double and, you know, we were kind of braced for the fact that, stress would go up and, you know, we would need to figure out how to, you know, that obviously our, you know, that idea that uh, love expands to fill everything, that's a great concept subjectively, right? But ultimately you do get diluted, right? Because there is, we all have the same 24 hours a day as anyone else. Um, and so we were bracing for that, but our son was such a different challenge. You know, he slept less, um, he really didn't like to be uh, in his car seat. So that would mean like, you know, 20 minutes speaking of, you know, trying to be mindful, right? Like just 20 minutes where you don't know what to do. Um, and we, you know, fell out of reserve. Uh, you know, empathy is a very important construct of a healthy relationship, but empathy requires you to have, you know, resilience left in your in your soul, you know? And so yeah. once you lose that resilience because of, you know, the, you know, because you're not used to that type of stress, um, things start to fissure. And that was certainly the case for us. Yeah. And, and with that situation, I, I can imagine that that causes a lot of issues. Um, do, do you mind sharing how you have essentially overcome or, or are dealing with them at this point and you know what how old was he again uh, you know at this uh, how old is he now uh he's four four so so, so four years later you know how, how are you able to r really align with your wife and really make that uh happen now at this point being on the same page so we did something drastic which you know i don't know that i would recommend it to everyone and it certainly um is a little bit specific to us um, but we just blew everything up. So I had a lot of things thrown at me at once. And so I was breaking at a certain point. We lived in the Bay Area. Um, we both had fairly good jobs, um, yet couldn't afford a single family home. Um, my brother unexpectedly passed away. And I was a uh, sort of a novice triathlete and used that um, to mitigate stress. And uh, a couple of months after finding out that my brother passed, I also found out that I had advanced osteoarthritis and that I wasn't going to be able to run again. And so I just didn't have any capacity to contribute, you know, at least for a finite part of time. And my wife was worn out because our son wasn't sleeping very much. Um, and so, you know, just that chronic fatigue, um, she's solid. You know, I, I never want to. I think someone's personal story, like overlaying that and using that as advice is precarious at best, um, you know, just because everyone's situation, and you probably know this better than most, considering you interview so many fathers, but, 
So I would hate to, you know, anyone to take any deep tape takeaways from our particular story, but yeah, I meant we, I couldn't, I couldn't help her and she was desperate for help because, you know, again, she was sort of braced for something as rudimentary as, uh, you know, the upbringing of her daughter and was faced with a true challenge, you know, from a, a gentleman that, you know, wasn't sleeping and, um, uh, not eating that well either. Um, so we just said we need a drastic change and, uh, we uprooted and moved to North Carolina and then kind of put it back together. Yeah. And that was good for us. Cause it's sort of like, you know, you blow up a puzzle and then you have some agency to sort of put it back together the way you want. But yeah. that commitment of saying that you want to put it back together is sort of the glue, you know, that makes sure that each one of you, you know, the, the partners know that there's some commitment there. That's actually that, that, uh, that theme of commitment is kind of what I heard throughout all that. So you tying it up with a bow at the very end there is perfect. Um, you know, for, if I think about a lot of dads out there and I know I'm guilty of this, you know, we have this mentality of, you know, I, I think that vulnerability is really understated in a, uh, in, in a relationship, especially, you know, the, the typical stereotypical male, you don't want them to be, uh, to be vulnerable and, and to show that emotion. I mean, did you suffer from any of that? And if you did, like, was that something that you were comfortable, you know, being open with your wife about how you were feeling and, and you guys were able to have a civil dialogue about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think if she heard the word civil, she'd laugh harder than I would. I mean, <laughs> I, uh, we were broken. So, you know, there was some times that, um, you know, again, I just don't want to candy coat it. I think the good news is that um, we were able to pragmatically get things back on track by actively listening. And then I think an important component of that was um, initially we were hoping to influence each other more of sort of meeting in the middle, because I think conventionally a lot of couples are able to do that. Um, but my wife and I are so a type, we're just uncompromising. So I think if there's one provocative takeaway, um, that's kind of even illuminated for me as you know, you've helped me walk through sort of this, you know, history of my life, the last seven years is the fact that we ended up compromising more than we did meeting in the middle. So we realized that we were both reluctant to change. And so we accepted that with uh, one another. And once we were able to do that, um, then instead we allowed the space for each one of us to be individuals rather than, you know, coming together as a unified whole, yeah. which I think is, you know, sort of the, the path well-traveled. And so we deviated from that and sort of carved our own way. Yeah, that's really powerful. Um, not a lot of people end up on the other end of those things in, in the sort of shape that you guys are in. So I think the fact that you guys moved cross country, the fact that you have kind of rebuilt, um, really everything, right? Like, I mean, your home, your, your family life, uh, from, from scratch and, in you know, in the hypothetical sense, it's, uh, it's fascinating, man. A and I think that it's wonderful, uh, that, that you guys were that. able to do that. Um, do, do you, there, there's feel... a key point there too, mm -hmm. like, yeah. just so that I don't lose it, um, sure. that if someone is going to sort of, you know, is listening and, um, one thing we were very intentional about, um, that, you know, seems to be a theme <laughs> for us tonight, um, was asking ourselves, are we just running away from our problems? Um, because one of the things I write about is something called variable hedonics. And so there was some strategy, you know, the idea of being able to, um, reduce our cost of living and, you, you know, using that to, um, improve various areas very intentionally, um, in our relationship was a key to the strategy of moving, mm -hmm. but we were also aware of several couples who had done the same thing as a form of escapism. And so we asked ourselves very critically, are we just running away from our problems? And if yeah. we agree that we are, let's not do this. And so, um, we sat with that because I think there was a side of us where we were both concerned, um, you know, that that might, that this might just be the easy way and not the hard way. Um, and ultimately we landed, you know, 
we did, you know, what a lot of A types do and, you know, created our pros and cons list. And <laughs> um, the pros definitely outweighed the cons, and we knew we were doing it for the right reasons. But um, I don't know. I would ask you. I mean, I, I have more than a few examples. So I think that's, you know, fairly common where someone might do this because they believe, you know, that a new environment will uh, fix a lot of the broken stuff. And that's not the case. So I just want to make sure that, you know, we at least address that elephant. Yeah. In the room. Uh, that, and that, and that's totally fair. And I, and I think that's a really great point. And, you know, looking at your situation here, you are on the other end of that. H- how confident do you feel in your decision and how confident do you feel in, you know, the, really the direction that you're taking at this point? So there's still open wounds. I miss my friends dearly. Um, you know, before we started rolling, I shared with you, you know, actually kind of relishing in, uh, those memories of, um, you know, uh, I grew up in an area near San Francisco. And so a lot of my friends, you know, settled there. Um, and so not having that access to them, I think, uh, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, the curse obviously is that friends are important for your well Um, uh, the blessing is that, that, you know, uh, creates an environment where I'm reliant more on, you know, feeling that type of connection with my family. And so I look at that as a big positive because that's what we needed at the time. And I'd still feel like I need that. I like that extra time and I still feel just connected enough. Um, but it's not for everyone. You know, I certainly think we're now away from infrastructure that if the other shoe dropped, you know, if we were truly in a situation, um, you know, where we needed uh, some helping hands or, um, you know, things of that nature, uh, friends and family are quite far away. So, you know, there's some baked in risk involved, but knock on wood, um, you know, the ROI as it were, subjective ROI, um, has paid off for us. Yeah. I don't know that I answered your question. You did. No, no, no. That, that is, uh, that that's, that's a fine answer. That's a fine place to be. And, and I think that everybody's experience will differ is a big part of that. You know, it's not like everybody is going to come out the other end of this thing, you know, these sort of things. Okay. And I think that people have to be understanding of that, especially if they're listening in right now, like you were saying, like, it's not a guaranteed fix. So, you know, just take that's that in for mind. sure. Um, you know, I, I want to talk about another thing, and, and this kind of harkens back a little bit to the to the conversation about fun and, and sort of the studies that you've done around this. Uh, a, a big part of kind of uplifting and, and uprooting the things that you were doing is, uh, and, and you, you and I talked a little bit about this, and I found it so profound and interesting. Like, you guys completely reinvented your nighttime routine with your with your kids. And you you really talked about how you lead with a with sort of a mindset of why aren't we having fun with this? How can we make this more fun? So so if you were to you know talk to the people here listening to this show, what are some takeaways that they should have to be you know considerate of where they are if they're not enjoying what they're doing today in their you know with their family routines? How they can kind of spice it up a little bit. Yeah. So I mean, let me back up a little bit there. I think, you know, again, getting back to basics, an effective strategy for anyone that's sort of looking to create more joy and fun opportunities in their life is to take, um, you know, an authentic audit of how they spend their 168 hours in a given week. Um, And so picking up on that to answer your question, that's what my wife and I did. Um, you know, we had kind of level set it to where we needed to get. And so, you know, a fun place once the dust settles and you're like, Hey, you know, things have healed enough that I can sort of, you know, go from, you know, above normal, um, uh, you know, it's to ask yourself those types of questions. And so one of the things that we identified in our week that was really, um, not fun for any involved within, you know, our family of four, uh, was the nightly routine for whatever reason, um, you know, after kind of being, uh, really conscientious about how we were spending our hours in a week, we realized that giving them baths was just something that was fairly awful for, for all involved. I don't know what it is and it's kind of come around now. Um, so we might need to revisit this cause I think, you know, you should take that type of audit periodically cause yeah. you know, life changes, right. <laughs> at, a, at a, um, 
uh, very quick pace. Um, but uh, so for us, we you know realized that that was a routine um, that wasn't bringing anyone joy, um, and we were trying to figure out how to fix it. And so initially, we looked at uh, you know we did have some extra resources uh, moving from California to North Carolina, and so we uh, you know looked at our at um, our budget and uh, tried to decide whether or not we could bring in a nanny, you know, to sort of help us with a lot of things. Um, and ultimately, we don't make enough money where that was an option for us. Um, but, you know, us both being somewhat creative, we're like, well, do you know, do we need a nanny full time? Um, and so we realized what what are the, you know, if we were able to afford a nanny, what are the aspects of a nanny that we would really need? Um, and obviously, you know, to to cut to the chase, um, this nighttime routine would be where we need the most help. So, uh, you know, it took a, a, a few tries, but we found someone um, that the kids loved that was willing to sort of, you know, use this hybrid model to so be a part time nanny. Um, and now she comes in, helps us, uh, you know, do sort of the nighttime routine uh, for three nights a week. And my wife and I now use that time. Um, to go have dinner t- together and sort of, you know, connect. And that's been the icing on the cake, man. Um, you know, like I shared with you, like we sort of rebuilt from scratch once we moved here, got things where we wanted them to be. And then, you know, being able to just spend, you know, those six hours out of the 168 hours um, where the kids are with someone they love for whatever reason, you know, um, they're <laughs> Dr. Jekyll and not Mr. Hyde <laughs> yeah. um, with this particular person. So they love that, you know, time with her. Um, and then, you know, uh, what couple gets to have, you know, six hours of just couple time, you know, especially with two kids. So um, certainly there are a lot of folks that have more resources than us that probably do, but you know, I think we're pretty, pretty average Joes. And, you know, so to be able to do that has just been uh, phenomenal for our relationship. And I'm very conscientious whether or not that's taking away anything, you know, where I'd look back at that and go, would I want those six hours back with my kids? Um, Cause I think that's an important question to ask, you know, similar, you know, it's an important question to ask, you know, if I'm moving somewhere else, um, you know, cause you never really want to regret a decision. And I just don't see that because the six hours were so miserable. Um, And so, again, I I believe that this is a one plus one equals three proposition where the kids are having a great time. We're now able to connect as a couple. The four of us come back together and it's additive because now, you know, we all want to be with each other. Again, going back to that idea of variable hedonics where, um, you know, you take something away and it's all, you know, you got to be really careful with the science there, but you know, in many instances, you remove yourself from a situation. When you go back to it, you appreciate it even more. And so, you know, the formula for us is just firing on all on all cylinders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's fascinating to me. And a lot of people, you know, and I think it's the the natural tendency of a parent to be like, okay, I have to sacrifice everything and all my time and everything for the kid. But you know, I I think it's. And it's a little counterintuitive to say this as a parent, but you know, you got to think of yourself every once in a while, and and especially your partner, um, because once the kids go, guess who's <laughs> who you're with? It's just you and your partner. So I, I think that that's um, that's certainly healthy for the relationship, and and I don't think it's a negative thing at all to say, you know, would I would I regret the time you know, spending here rather than, you know, spending time with the kids. I don't think that's a negative thing. I think that's an honest to God question that you have to ask yourself in a lot of cases. Uh, because like I said, you have to really think of yourself in, in some of these cases, if you're taking care of yourself, you're really taking care of your family as well. Um, oh, self care is important. And so important. it's probably for a different podcast. Cause to be honest, I'm not the right, you know, I don't have the right set of expertise um, to go down this rabbit hole with the exception of the fact that I have a Filipino wife who, you know, um, her family, you know, is first generation. She's very American, but, you know, so I at least get a taste of that. And I think in collectivist cultures, um, you know, I can speak specifically about Filipino cultures. Um, you know, uh, grandparents are called Lolo and Lola and they, you know, you're able to just bring your kids over to, you know, um, because there's a lot more, you know, it takes a, a tribe, right, type mentality. 
Um, and I think in Western culture, um, you know, again, because of hustle porn and, you know, the fact that we just always are on here and a lot of us do move away from our parents, you know, again, that's part of the recipe that we currently have going on. Yeah. We don't have those types of resources where I think in other cultures, you know, uh, it's perfectly okay to, you know, go on a date with your spouse and maybe live your kids with the grandparents for a weekend. And you still see that here, but it's just not as prevalent or, um, you also feel like you're burdening, um, That's, you your know, you, grandparents or whatever. yeah, you just said something really interesting because, because, and if I'm just reflecting for a moment on my situation, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my family's Cuban, my wife's family is Italian. And so like, we're always just, you know, family, family, family all the time. And, and so you have this support system all around you. But I, I think that if I were to reflect back on what you said, the Western culture is, it's very true. You don't have that, that it's, um, it's a guilt thing. There's a guilt piece to it as a parent. Um, if I, if I kind of reflect back on some of the other conversations that I've had with people, yeah, that, that's a, that's a very true statement. What you just said. It's very interesting. Yeah. I think as a generalization, but there's flavors yeah. of it. Right. And like, again, since, you know, um, no, but you're right. You know, so for each person, it's going to be different, but I, I've been trying to grow into that as well because I feel, you know, we both use the word obligation. And I think, um, you know, I, there is this obligation I feel to be a good father. And part of that, you know, is being very present and mindful of the things that I do and the areas that I contribute. Um, and so where I believe I'm doing better, you know, going back to the six hour example is there is no, um, there's no cost to that where like, um, you know, other areas like, you know, missing an event at school or missing a parade, you know, where you have a very deliberate choice of like, do I need to attend that webinar or can I go see my kid, you know, do a 20 minute play? Like I just see so many of my friends choose the webinar where it's like, dude, really? You know, like, (laughs) um, that's sad. I, I, I think, well, okay. If that's your choice, it's your choice. Like I don't want to like I don't want to crap on people if that's what they feel like they want to do with their time. I don't know. It's a, it's not that's not for me. Like I I really cherish when I'm able to disconnect and I go into dad mode in the evening. Um, you know where we're you know going back. Like if I uh, to our conversation earlier, like you know as long as I'm in the moment, you know, uh, I, I really I really enjoy that and I love it and I, I wouldn't give that up for a webinar. That's me. But, and I think that's important, right? So I use that to be, you know, I trivialized it to make a point. Yeah, but yeah. Um, again, for the sake of being authentic, my parents choose the other. My parents are both professors from UC Davis. Um, they grew up in a publisher parish um, sort of environment where that was the culture, at, you know, um, within UC Davis, at least in the period that I grew up. Tenure was super important to get. So um, the pressures, you know, of um, being part of that tribe and just grinding things out and making sure that you're getting in the right journals, you know, which meant putting in 70 hours a week um, was important to them. And so they forsake time with me and my brother. Um, and I don't know that they regret it, you know. So I, I think that is I'm glad that you brought that up because I also don't want to. It's important for me not to guilt people that might decide, you know, that their priorities are a little bit different for me, particularly uh, my kids and my family are my priority. So I always want to bias towards action where um, I prioritize them. Yeah. It's just, yeah. You know, and if that means that I'm never going to make it back to the C-suite, you know, so be it. Yeah. And, and thinking about your situation growing up, I mean, how, how did that affect you with your parents, Choosing that, you know, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like a negative thing by any means. So don't take it the wrong way. But it's like well, it affected me negatively. But my brother it? was fine. Okay. So, and I've forgiven them. I mean, I buried that hatchet. But, um, yeah. I mean, I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I could imagine that's really hard for a lot of people. And uh, I I haven't had to experience that firsthand. I mean, my dad worked a lot as a kid, but like there was always an under. I don't know. Like like growing up in a like in my household and kind of knowing what both sets of my grandparents had to go through to, you know, make money and, and 
kind of make it like that uh, work was just kind of like a thing that I understood, but I didn't have it to that extreme. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, no, that, that's interesting. But, um, you said that you married your wife at a young age mm-hmm. who comes from a military family. I assume you got to at least see it firsthand. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, people who have listened to this show have heard my interview with my father-in-law. Um, and you know, I, I would recommend people go back and listen to that. You know, my father-in-law talks about some of the, the sacrifices that he had to make, you know, for, uh, for, for his time in the Marine Corps. Um, and some of the time that it really took away from family. I think it's a, it's a really interesting conversation and, and something that I think is really taboo, but something worth talking about and in a really civilized way, because I think that a lot of people need to be aware of what, uh, of if they have that tendency and if they're okay with it or not. I think that some people just fall into it and just follow the, the, the patterns of it. And it doesn't necessarily click that it could be harming somebody else or if, um, it, uh, or just simply having that awareness is powerful. So, yeah. But, and then I think, you know, it's important again, to be, have a well-rounded sort of sense of that, right? Because I'm sure you're aware, um, you know, and again, this is why I said, you know, we got to be really careful because it's such a deep rabbit hole, right? But the this concept of dual parenting is still fairly new, right? I mean, yeah. you know, it's less than 50 years old. And so, you know, dads are spending two to three times, um, you know, by duration, right? So because they weren't spending that much time with their kids, you know, back in the 50s and 60s. And so, you know, it wasn't hard to double or triple it up. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Say in the 2020s. So you got to be careful, you know, with the metrics there. But, you know, stating that that is the case, yeah, we're spending, you know, two to three X the amount of times that our prior generation fathers did. And I think there's certain stresses there that aren't necessarily brought up. And so in the context of forgiving yourself that, in that 168 hours, I am for going six hours, you know, and the fact that I'm making an active choice and deciding whether or not um, that's additive or, you know, potentially harmful, I think is important. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, the real nugget there is that it's fairly easy. I mean, to, to kind of look back considering that, you know, um, 56 hours of that is likely sleep. It's not that hard to sort of you know, be very, uh, deliberate about how, you know, what you do in a given week. Um, so, you know, with that being said, I think you, you can't really forgive yourself if, um, if those things go awry, you know, like if if you're actively paying attention to how you're spending your time, that guilt should ultimately fade away because you are being very deliberate about how you make your choices. Um, you know, whether that is, you know, that I need to put in 60 hours because I've chosen to be a lawyer and I'm going to figure out, you know, quality over quantity, or you're someone like myself that's like, ah, uh, well, you know, s- science has kind of suggested that, you know, quality time <laughs> is a bunch of bullshit. And so, <laughs> you know, quantity to me is more important. Yeah. Also, I like, I, I could totally be a stay at home dad. I would love that. I, I love oh the the amount yeah. of time that I'm able to spend with Ari and the, and the flexibility my, my employer gives to, you know, understanding like when it's dad time, it's dad time. And like, I, I feel tremendously blessed and appreciative of that. Like I wouldn't have it any other way. And it allows me to, you know, go pick her up at daycare. Um, and then, cause both my wife and I both work. And so we have a daycare, uh, when my mom and my, mother-in-law don't watch her and then you know we bring her home and feeding her dinner and then we're playing and then you know we like tonight we sat down and watched beauty and the beast because it's like one of her favorite movies right now and uh we were singing along to the songs like it's just it's 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 so fun like i could do that all day dude i love it that's awesome i love (laughs) it now now let's um let's talk about this topic of you know speaking of fun and not an intentional segue but we're going to segue anyway you know you have this book that you're working on um, why don't you take a moment to share with the audience at home the whole premise about this book and where they can learn a little bit more about it? Oh, I appreciate that um, opportunity. Yeah, so uh, for the last couple of years, it really was spawned by my brother's passing and then somewhat, you know, as I had, 
have confessed, um, you know, that I was a bit broken and using, you know, a lot of strategies that we've discussed throughout the podcast to sort of put things back together. Um, and I think it's a really opportune time. You know, we've mentioned burnout a, a few times throughout our dialogue, you know, this idea that people really have architected fun out of their lives. And so the book really focuses on a lot of the simple things, um, you know, simple tactics that people can sort of deploy to one, um, realize that fun has been, you know, architected out of their life and then simple ways to sort of bring that back in, you know, and uh, none of it is that profound. I think it's just the value is having it all in one place. Um, you know, so that some of the things that I did talk about, um, through the course of, of this podcast, you know, someone can implement them themselves from sort of looking at the way they spend their 168 hours, um, you know, to find, the things that aren't bringing them joy that can, you know, potentially be replaced or just omitted altogether. Um, and then replacing those with things that, you know, once did bring them joy. Um, and then, you know, ideas of, uh, um, you know, ways to bundle things. Um, another thing that I've done with my daughter, I think I mentioned to it in, in the pre-call, um, you know, is this idea of activity bundling, right? So mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to exercise more, um, and at the same time, I want to be able to spend more time with my daughter. So, you know, with just a little ounce of creativity, I'm like, why don't I just go to dance lessons with my daughter? Um, again, you know, it's something where I spent a little bit more money than I would have if I just sent my daughter to dance classes. Um, but for just a few extra dollars, you know, her and I get private lessons. And I've, you know, told the instructor that, um, I also want there to be an aerobic component because I'm trying to lose some weight. Hey, there um, so there are all That's sorts great. of little hints and tactics throughout the book on, you know, ways to sort of take your daily life and inject it with more fun. Very cool. No, it's it's so fascinating. Like this has been such an an awesome conversation. I love having these sort of like philosophical, really deep rooted conversations kind of around some of the things that we don't really think about that happen in our psyche that, uh, that, that really promote, uh, like, you know, good parenting habits, good, good habits as human beings in general. I'm, I'm a big fan of all that and, and mindfulness in general. So this is, this is really great. And, you know, um, I always like to end the, the, the conversation, uh, on the dad chronicle with some words of wisdom. Now, if you were to kind of think back, you know, to to Mike Rucker, you know, a few years ago when you were dealing with some of these struggles and let's say somebody is dealing with these similar struggles, like what would you say to them to give them words of encouragement and wisdom at this point? Wow. OK. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I would have had a pull quote if you had just asked me off the top, but you <laughs> added some construct to, to roll it back a couple of years. I think all things shall pass. Right. Like, uh so that was a fairly dark place, right? And when you get, um, you know, when you're in there, it's hard to see that things will change. But if you are an active participant in that and are really deliberate about, um, you know, I'm, I said the idiom a few times, you know, kind of look for that low hanging fruit so that you can get some wins to create, you know, a flywheel that will get you out of that darkness. Um, it happens fairly quickly, especially as we get older, right? And since yeah. I know a large part of your audience is fathers, you know, as soon as we're fathers, we realize how fast time goes, right? And so um, I think that's one of the benefits that I got, um, you know, from something as tragic as that, even though like right after my brother passed, um, you know, I also found out that I could never run again. I realized that I w that clock was now ticking, even though it had been ticking the whole time. So the words of wisdom is if you are in a dark place, you know, if it's clinical, get some help because if it's biological, there's, you know, there's going to be no sort of psychological or, you know, philosophy tricks that are going to get you out of that. Yeah. But if it's just, you know, a place where you feel you're, you're in a rut, I mean, figure out some environmental tweaks, figure out how you can be intentional, um, you know, uh, deconstruct your system so that you uh, can get something simple that actually works. So you're not thinking about the big picture. You're just like, you know, pick one thing, whether, you know, again, we've run the gambit, right. And we've given permission so that if, you know, it, if not being a good father is outside of your capacity right now, that doesn't have to be it. Right. 
um, to your point, sometimes self-care is needed first because you have to take care of yourself before you can sort of contribute to others. But whatever it is, you know, create a system so that you can get that flywheel going um, and, uh, you know, and and all things shall pass. Yeah. Tremendous amount of wisdom, Mike. That's great. Now, uh, let's make sure people know where to reach you. So so what's the best way for people to learn about the work that you're doing and to get in contact with you if they're interested? Uh, so michaelrucker.com. Uh, in fact, actually, just this week, uh, rebooted the website and all my social links are on there. And, um, you know, if you like any of the stuff that we talked about today, uh, you know, write about it extensively. So, yeah, I would love to... Um, you know, anyone that's interested, it's easy to sign up for my newsletter. And, um, that way you get my email address as well. And I read all incoming emails. So, you know, if anyone wants to contact me, they can sign up for the newsletter and then they'll have my email address. And then again, all my social channels are on the website, michaelrucker.com. Oh, brilliant, Mike. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for sharing your story and for sharing so much wisdom. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Alex. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks again to special guest Michael Rucker. This was such a fun conversation, and I learned a ton. And he's got a great story as well. So I definitely encourage you to uh, throw him a follow on uh, social media and to sign up for his newsletter. Keep an eye out for that book. It's going to be a really great read. I know I'm definitely going to check it out. Now, if you enjoyed what you listened to today, give us a five-star rating on iTunes. And also consider supporting this show. If you head over to thedadchronicle.com, there's a link to become a patron And we have a lot of really awesome rewards if you become a patron. So definitely consider that and check it out. And if you'd like to chime in on the conversation, email the Dad Chronicle podcast at gmail.com. And if you'd like to get my contact information, everything can be found over at incastmedianetwork.com. Thanks for listening. I'll see you guys next time. If you like this show, check out more great content at incastmedianetwork.com.